Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Monday morning, May 20th, 2024. I hope everybody's doing all right today. Got folks joining on. Good to see you. Good morning, Gail. As always, if you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments section as we are streaming, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. We're cross-posted onto the nearchurches.com Facebook page. The audio is being recorded, will be uploaded to our Podbean channel, and then, of course, once the video is over, the live stream is over, I'll upload the content to our YouTube channel. Seems like everything's working all right. I'm getting some weird stuff going on on my computer screen. Let me know everything's going all right, that you can hear me okay, and that the video is okay, because on my computer screen in front of me, it looks like everything keeps on resetting, but so far as I can tell, everything's all right. Good morning, Miss Janie. We are ready for Isaiah chapter 54 today, where we'll start. Janie says it's okay here. Well, I, th I think it's okay, too. I'm watching it on the Near Churches page, and it looks okay, and I don't know. Sometimes OBS acts a little goofy, and it appears as it's being a little bit goofy today, but all right, I think we're okay. Isaiah chapters 54 and 55 is the plan for today. We obviously looked last week, the last time we were together, at the end of Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13, and we did Isaiah 52 and 53 there, talking about this, thank you, Lyle, talking about this suffering servant, which of course is Christ. We, you know, we, we encounter Isaiah 53 in Acts chapter 8, when the eunuch from Ethiopia is returning home from Jerusalem. He had been there to worship, and he's reading the prophet Isaiah, and He's asked the question, do you understand what you read? And he said, well, how can I unless some man teaches me, guides me? And so Philip began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Isaiah 54 is very closely connected with that. Again, something that I try to emphasize as I teach through scripture is sometimes it's good to ignore the chapter and verse breakups. And I think this will kind of play that out today. So what we have at the end of Isaiah chapter 53 is essentially the the success of God's plan through his suffering servant the spoil is going to be divided among the strong there God's will is going to be accomplished his his plan to save man is going to come to pass he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors so as you turn your page to Isaiah chapter 54, sing, O barren, you who have not born. Now, the first several verses, let me look at my personal Bible here, down, basically down through about verse 8, you have praise for God and how it, what he's just said in Isaiah chapter 53 in regard to this suffering servant and what all he is going to do and what all his suffering is going to accomplish for God and for man is now connected with the nation of Israel here specifically in chapter 54. It's interesting because Isaiah 54 and verse 1, let me highlight it all here, Sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. That's an odd-sounding verse to me when I read it, but it makes sense biblically because I want to show you this. What I'm going to do today is connect several New Testament passages to these prophecies that are in chapters 54 and 55. Hey, good morning, Anna. Good to see you. So you have Isaiah 54 and verse 1. Well, if you were to take your Bible into the New Testament to Galatians chapter 4, and it really begins in verse, I think it's verse 22. No, it's verse 21, where Paul is addressing the Galatians, their problem with their temptation to go back under the law of Moses. Galatians 4.21 says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? And he then does, a, he, he writes an, an allegory, all right? He writes this figure of speech for the rest of Galatians chapter 4 about Abraham and his two sons, one by the bondwoman, of course, that's a reference to Abraham and Hagar's son, Ishmael, and the other son by the free woman. Well, that's Abraham with Sarah and Isaac. 
and it's a comparison between how Hagar and Ishmael are, you might say, representative of the law of Moses, bondage, okay, the bond woman, as opposed to Abraham's son Isaac through Sarah. That's the free woman, the son of promise, etc. Those things are symbolic. Abraham, Hagar, Ishmael, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, they represent something for those Christians. He says, for these are the two covenants. That's the representation. That's the symbol. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And then, uh, of course, Jerusalem, which is above, is from is free. The spiritual Jerusalem, not physical Jerusalem. But anyway, in, in Galatians 4.27, Paul quotes Isaiah 50, 54, verse 1. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the des desolate has many more children than he than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So when you sit down and you read Isaiah 54, you now see the spiritual connection to Christ and his church, to the, the Christian and the new covenant, if you want to frame it that way. But uh, that's one of those cross-references that's good to know so that when you are reading Isaiah chapter 54, let's skip back over there real quick. This chapter is full of prophecies, and again, there are other New Testament references that I'm going to show you about the New Covenant. Okay, so barren, without child. Now again, when Isaiah's writing, as, as I've tried to emphasize throughout this series of videos, captivity's still coming, punishment's still coming, their city's going to be destroyed and all of that. But in the future, you have these promises being fulfilled. Uh, verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. They're in, this, in this promise of verse 1, again, that we see fulfilled through Christ, through Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac there in Galatians chapter 4, what we're talking about here essentially is the borders of the spiritual kingdom of God, the church. There, there's going to be more than enough room for everybody who wants to be let's say, in Christ. That's what we're ultimately talking about here. Expand to the left, uh, expand to the right and to the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. All right, this, this is, again, this is a reference to the spiritual kingdom, to the kingdom of Christ, and the abundant, let's say, the abundant room that is made by God's grace. Anybody and everybody's welcome into the kingdom of Christ. It's not exclusively Jewish. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. It's not exclusively Gentile. It's, it's whoever submits their will to God's will. Hey, Susan, good to see you. All right, so do not fear nor be ashamed, verse 4. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. Why is that the case? As, he's, as Isaiah is writing this to the nation of Israel of his day, looking forward to the coming kingdom, why is this the case? Well, because your maker is your husband. So that tells us right there, Isaiah 54, 5, who the audience of this prophecy is. So again, you go back into the end of chapter 52, all of chapter 53, the suffering servant who is so, who's going to suffer and die. And now the, the result of that is, well, abundant room, abundant grace, let's say it that way, through Christ to Israel, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God. And this is important here in verse 5, and I'll connect it to the New Testament. He is called the God of the whole earth. And we've I've touched on that throughout these videos. One of the problems that, it, that the Jews had was essentially, we might today we might use the word racism, nationalism, however you want to say it. God belonged to them. He didn't belong to anybody else. Nobody else belonged to him. That's one thing that needed to be corrected, and that is corrected in the New Testament. So let me, I will show you here just quickly. God is the God of the whole earth over in Romans chapter 3, and, and the book of Romans does this extensively, shows that God is the God of both the Jews and the Gentiles, not just the God of the Jews. But here in Romans 3 and verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcision by faith, the Jews, and the uncircumcised through faith, the Gentiles. So, there's another New Testament connection for you for, the, for 
Isaiah chapter 54. The promised blessings that are coming in this spiritual kingdom that are that is established by the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53 leaves room for all. Now notice what he says here. So again, Isaiah 54 and verse 5, we've already read who God is and whose is God. He's the God of the whole earth. Then he says this in verse 6. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you, refu- when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. I think that's a reference to captivity, what's getting ready to happen. Now again, as we've noted throughout Isaiah, northern Israel has already been taken by the Assyrians. Um, it's it's going to happen to southern Israel, to Judah, by the Babylonians. And so for a mere moment, all right, so think about it, think about it like this, Isaiah 54, 7. For a mere moment, I have forsaken you. Now, 70 years. Hey, Miss Barbara, good to see you. In in regard to, let's say, my perspective, 70 years, that's a, you know, that's a fairly long time. But what is 70 years in comparison to God's eternal purpose? Well, it's it's nothing. A mere moment, I have forsaken you. But with great mercies, I will gather you. Now, again, obviously that would have a reference to their being gathered back from Babylonian captivity. Yes, but ultimately I think the fulfillment is here in Christ in the spiritual kingdom. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. All right, so that's the promise. Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 8, restoration ultimately, that restoration being accomplished through the spiritual kingdom of Christ. And then he says this in Isaiah 54, 9. And what this does is a couple of things. Well, number one, it shows us the mercy of God because he is going to restore his people. But then also it validates the, the early chapters of Genesis, uh, the, the account of Noah, Genesis chapters 6 through 9. So I'm teaching Genesis on Wednesday nights, and I'm, ta- I'm taking my time through the first 11 chapters because a lot of people look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis as an allegory, as some type of spiritual poem and not actual history and actual events. But there are so many references throughout your Bible to the events of the early chapters of Genesis. You know, the creation, the flood, those events, but also the the individuals that were involved. So here's one of those instances where a later writing confirms what happened in the early chapters of Genesis. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, well, the, that promise is made in chapters, the end of uh, Genesis 8, and also in Genesis chapter 9. So just like I made that covenant or that promise, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Well, again, once once the captivity is over, which is coming, it's inevitable. It's just like the flood. God sent the flood. God punished the earth, uh, sinful man, eight souls were saved by the flood. But when that was finished, his covenant was, I will never destroy the earth with a flood again. And the sign of the covenant is, I'll put my bow in the cloud. So when you see it, it's a covenant that that's never going to happen again. Well, the same thing is true in that sense with the church, with, with the ultimate fulfillment here of these prophecies in regard to the church. You're going into captivity, but when all of that's over, There's going to be an everlasting covenant. Nothing like that's ever going to happen again. The church, the kingdom of God on earth, will never go into captivity like physical Israel did. It's not going to happen. The mountains shall depart, the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. All right, so a couple of thoughts there. My covenant of peace. Well, there's a verse, well, there's more than one verse, but... There's a verse that I think of in Philippians chapter 4 that talks about this peace that is available to God's people. It's probably a verse you're familiar with. The peace of God which passes or surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, that peace can only come, the peace that Isaiah is speaking of prophetically, the peace that Paul is speaking of there in Philippians chapter 4, can only be accessed when you're in a covenant relationship with God today when you're in Christ, when you're in the body of Christ, which is the church. You know, you can't, there's no way to be right with Christ 
to be right with God and to separate yourself from the church. And, you know, so many people have that strange idea that, that I could be religious or I can be a spiritual person, but I don't have to have any connection with a religious group. I don't have to have any connection with a church. I can, I can do what I want to do in regard to my relationship with God without all of that. No, you can't. It's not possible to do that. So anyway, all of this says the Lord who has mercy on you. All right? So, notice this in verse 11. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Well, again, that's, that's the current day situation here of Isaiah's audience. That's what they're going through at this time. Again, they're facing that captivity. But notice this. Behold, I will lay. All right, this is future tense, and I'm going to connect this to another New Testament passage. I think this is extremely helpful in understanding this particular New Testament packet, uh, passage. All right, so now you're afflicted. Right now you're not comforted. Well, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. You sit there and think about that for just a minute. This mention of these precious stones, these rubies, sapphires, crystal, and is there any particular Bible passage that comes to your mind that, that uses that type of language in the New Testament? I'm going to turn over to Revelation chapter 21 and show you something here. So a lot of people, when they get to Revelation chapters 21 and 22, they want to talk about heaven. You know, I don't think, I don't think that, you're, that a person would be absolutely dead wrong to look at Revelation 21 and 22 and say that's foreshadowing, it's, it's in essence prophesying of the beauties of heaven. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm not going to call you out if you hold that particular belief, but I think there's something more to it, more significant to it than that, particularly for the people to whom the book of Revelation was written, those seven churches of Asia, who are going through persecution, who, who repeatedly in chapters 2 and 3 are told to overcome, and if you overcome, here, here will be the results of your having overcome whatever you're going through. Really, as you start getting in the book of Revelation, particularly in chapter 17, victory is inevitable. It's like chap, from chapter 6 to 16, it's almost like victory is questionable. In, in the battle between good and evil. Once you hit chapter 17, there's no doubt, as we say, who's going to win. So Revelation chapters 21 and 22, in my opinion, with the larger context of the book of Revelation, show us a, or, yeah, show us, give us a picture, give John actually a picture of the church that has endured, the church that has overcome her persecution, and that is glorified, that is what she is supposed to be. So he talks about this new heaven and new earth because the first heaven and first earth had passed away. There's no more sea. And there's something, he sees this, verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, as we've been reading Isaiah, we've been reading about Zion, we've been reading about Jerusalem. This one that John sees is coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride for her a, a prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, so just think about that one verse right there, Revelation 21 and verse 2. If these two chapters are about heaven, then how does heaven come out of heaven and down away from God? This this word here in Revelation 21 and verse 2, from is the Greek preposition apo, apo and that's what it means, like down and away from. I don't think this, these chapters are talking about heaven because this is something that comes down out of heaven and away from God. And not only that, it's a bride, as a bride, prepared for her husband. Well, biblically, what is the bride? Well, we know that that's a reference to the church. We're married to Christ, Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Anyway, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and 
and be their God. Well, what is the, what's the temple of God, the tabernacle of God today? Well, it's the church, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay. Let me see. Let me scroll down here. Anyway, so remember back to Isaiah chapter 54, these people who were afflicted and they didn't have any comfort, God says, well, all right, that's your case now, but I, I'm going to lay your stones with colorful gems and your foundations with sapphires, your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal. All right, so you just keep reading through Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, through Revelation chapter 21. And John is given this message, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Well, who is the bride of Christ? It's not heaven. It's the church. And again, I think Revelation chapters 21 and 22 are simply a snapshot of the church that has endured, that has overcome, and that is, in essence, glorified with Christ. So he sees this. Again, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven. It's not going into heaven to see heaven. Something's coming down out of heaven from God. All right, notice this. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. She had a great high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels, uh, three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. Um, you have the foundation. The city is four square. Uh, you have the measurements of the city. Now notice here in Revelation 21, 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper and the city of pure gold like pure, uh, like clear glass. The foundations were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. Goes all goes through all 12 foundations, you know, the apostles' representation of their authority. The, the church is established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20. So this city has 12 foundations. It's literally built on 12 foundations. Tie that in with Ephesians 2.20. There were 12 gates of pearl. You've got gold, like transparent. So you have all of these descriptions in Revelation. Now let me flip back here to Isaiah chapter 54. The people who in Isaiah's day were afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, a change is coming. I'll lay your stones with colorful gems, lay your foundations with sapphires, make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. That sounds a lot like Revelation chapter 21 to me. And if Isaiah is prophesying of the kingdom of Christ, and he is, I think you can tie Isaiah 54 and Revelation chapter 21 together and get a pretty good picture of the value of the church, the beauty of the, the kingdom of God. Not only that, all right, so I made those connections, verses 11 and 12 with Revelation 21, and I guess specifically verses 18 through 20 or so. But then you have this in Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Well, let me tie this New Testament passage with that. All of your children. If this is talking about the church, and I think it is, tie this passage in with that idea, that all your children shall be taught by the Lord. I'm going to flip over here to John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. Jesus says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. We have to be drawn by God. The question is, how does that drawing happen? Right here. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, who, uh, therefore everyone who has heard and has learned of me, or learned from the Father, comes to me. All right? Keep that in your mind. They shall all be taught by God. John 6, 45. Isaiah 54, 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. See, in Judaism, hey, Brian, hey, Wayne, good to see you guys. In Judaism, you're born to Jewish parents, and when you're born, you're circumcised the eighth day. And, and circumcision is the sign of your covenant relationship. It goes all the way back to Genesis 17. It's not so in Christianity. You're not, when, when you're born physically, you're not born into the church. You're not born as a Christian. You have to be taught and born again. And so Isaiah 54, 13 with John 6, 44 and 45, you've got to be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. So again, we're talking about the ultimately in Isaiah 54, I think the establishment of the church. 
Notice how this chapter ends, and I've, I've spent more time here than I had anticipated, but notice how this chapter ends here. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. So talking about the sovereignty of God, the power of God, you have these things that exist, blacksmiths, weapons, all of this. But to Israel, he says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Now, here's the thing. When you look at Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon, uh, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So Babylon destroys them in 586 B.C., but that's not the last time that that happens. Of course, ultimately, and I've mentioned this several times through our study of Isaiah, the Romans do that in A.D. 70. So this can't be talking about physical Israel because there were weapons fastened against, uh, fastened. There were weapons formed against physical Israel that did prosper after this is written. And again, specifically, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70 that forever ended the, the ability to trace one's Jewish lineage. It, it, the, the temple's destroyed. All of that was ended by the Romans. So this can't be talking about physical Israel. These, Isaiah 54 is about spiritual Israel, ultimately fulfilled in the church, the kingdom of Christ, because of what Christ has done, which is what you read about in Isaiah chapter 53. All right? This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me. You're not righteous by yourself. Now, we're commanded. All right, so let me, let me just show you this real quick. Matthew chapter 5, and this is the Sermon on the Mount, and I understand that Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience, but there's something to this statement here. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Each person is responsible to be righteous before God. And the only way that you can be righteous before God, and I will show you this, is in 1 John chapter 3, I think it's around verse 7 or 8. Yeah, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. So each of us is responsible for that. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me. Well, here's, So here's my question. How do you know what to do to be righteous? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 1 and verse 17 that the righteousness of God is is found in the gospel. It's not found in myself. It's not found, you don't find it within yourself. Righteousness comes from God in that perspective, in, uh, in that sense. So then what you have, and I, I like how it's titled here, you have this great kingdom that's promised in Isaiah 54, but then you have an invitation to the abundant life. And that, that really, um, the abundant life, well, what, what did Jesus say? I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10 and verse 10. You have the invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. So basically what you have in Isaiah chapter 55 is the, the invitation to come to God. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come buy milk, uh, wine and milk without money and without price. Things that are valuable, things that sustain you. All right, so... Listen to that invitation in Isaiah 55, 1. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And think of this passage, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, where the book of Revelation ends. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. The kingdom, the, the servant's going to die, Isaiah 53. There's going to be a kingdom that's established in peace and righteousness, chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 55, everybody's welcome. Whoever's thirsty can come. You don't have to pay for it. There's nothing you can, in fact, pay for it. Um, so why would you do something like that? Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? You're not going to find your spiritual sustenance in anything but God, in anything but in Christ. So here's what you've got to do. You've got to incline your ear and come to me, to God. Here in your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. 
What is that everlasting covenant? The sure mercies of David. And this is such a significant passage, and I can already see, I've already gone just right at 30 minutes, so we're going to go a little bit over today, but that's okay. The sure mercies of David. Now, that man, this connects so many biblical passages, uh, so many thoughts in Scripture, prophecies in Scripture. I'll just show you one specifically in regard to David. This is when he expressed to Nathan his desire to build the temple. Nathan said, all right, go do what you want to do. And God said, no, he's not going to build my temple, but his son will. But then he makes this prophecy here, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. When your days, to David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now that prophecy is tied directly to Jesus in the New Testament. And this idea here in Isaiah chapter 55, these sure mercies of David, and notice they're in connection with an everlasting covenant. The New Testament tells us exactly what this is talking about because it's quoted, and I'm turning over here to Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 32. And let's see here. Where does it, where does it really begin? Um, I guess it really begins in verse, this particular context, begins in Acts 13, verse 13. And he starts preaching here in verse 16. Paul stood up motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And so he starts preaching. He talks about David, who was raised up as king. All right. From this man's seed, according to his promise, God raised up Israel a savior, Jesus. So now we know who this seed of David is, who would build a kingdom. That's Jesus. So let me get down here to Acts 13 and verse... Oh, I'll get down to about verse 32. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which is made to your fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. His physical, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't die again. He ascended to be with the Father. Okay, so that's what Acts 13, 34 says. Uh, he, he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. This is in connection with the resurrection. This is in connection with the, the establishment of the kingdom of Christ. And right there in Acts 13, 34, as Paul's preaching, he takes Isaiah 55 and applies it directly to Jesus. The sure mercies of David that's in reference to the promises that were made to David by God through Nathan about the establishment of the church, ultimately. So he says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. That, again, is a reference to the resurrection of Jesus. All right, David died, he was buried, and saw corruption. David was not raised from the dead, but Jesus was, and he saw no corruption. And it's through him that the forgiveness of sins is preached and you have to believe in him because you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. So I know that's, that's a large section of scripture and I just kind of scanned over it quickly. But when you're reading Isaiah chapter 55 and when God tells the house of Israel here, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David, you can now connect 2 Samuel 7 with Isaiah 55 and see its fulfillment in the church, said by Paul, in Acts chapter 13. Pretty, It's so important to be able to connect all these passages together, to make them make sense, and to, to have a good understanding. Okay, so not only, so now these promises made to David, made specifically to the house of Israel, to the Jews, but notice this. Isaiah 55, 5, Surely you shall call a nation you do not know. Well, he knew the Jews. They were his people. And nations who do not know you shall run to you because, the Lord, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. That's a reference to the Gentiles. And again, that is only fulfilled in Christ. That's only fulfilled in the new covenant. 
you know, earlier I mentioned Romans 3 and verse 29. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? You could read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 that lay out the case that, that a nation whom he did not know, he will know, and they would run to him. All of that's prophecy, and it's all fulfilled in the church. So what do you do? You seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him who is near. The wicked has to forsake his way. One of the things that I notice in Isaiah chapter 55, oh, thank you, Susan, I appreciate that. One of the things I notice throughout Isaiah chapter 55, and it really starts back up here in verse 1, is come, all right? Verse 1, come. Come by wine and milk. You've got these invitations repeatedly. You get down here in verse six, uh, verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. Forsake, let the wicked forsake his way. My point is personal responsibility. God can't do this for you, and he will not do this for you. That's why uh, back in Isaiah chapter 54, I took time to go to John chapter 6 about being taught. If you're going to be drawn to God through Christ, you have to be taught. You're not born into a relationship with God anymore. You have to be taught his way. You have to forsake his way. The unrighteous man has to forsake his thoughts. You have to return to the Lord. And when you do all of that, God will have mercy on him. And he will abundantly pardon. Very familiar passage here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Who is, and the prophets ask this several times, who's going to counsel God? Who's going to give him advice on anything, let alone what we often refer to as God's scheme of redemption? the bringing in of the Gentiles, the, the establishing of an everlasting covenant of peace that's based on the sure mercies of David. Whoever gave God the advice to, to work all of that out? Well, nobody did, because he is so much higher than we. For as the rains come down and the snow from heaven, they don't return there, but water the earth, bring, forth the flat, bring it forth and bud, give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. There's a point to what he's saying here. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And the particular context here, again, to me, it goes all the way back into, into Isaiah chapter 52 of this servant who's going to come and who's going to die, the establishment of a covenant of peace, the establishment of a kingdom. This is going to happen. All right? Isaiah's day, Israel, you're going into captivity. You're going to be restored, but... In the future, all of this is going to come to pass. You're going to go out with joy and be led out with peace. Well, you think about the blessings that are in Christ. You think about one thing that I think about is how many of Paul's letters, and I think even Peter does this, as they open their letters, something along the lines of grace and peace and joy be unto you, all of that's found in Christ. It's not found anywhere else. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Well, we, we understand that trees don't have hands, nor do they clap, and mountains and hills don't sing. This is just the idea of you see all the wisdom of God in the planning and in the, the enactment and the fulfillment of his scheme of redemption through the suffering servant and all of creation praises him. It's kind of like, let me show you this real quick. This is, so I'm going through Revelation on Sunday nights here at Mammoth Spring, and when John is given the vision of the throne room of God in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, I'm not going to read all of this, but let's see. What are the people, what people, what are the individuals, the beings around God's throne in heaven doing? Well, they're praising him. You are worthy, Revelation 4, 11, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Constant praise for God for what he has done. So that's kind of the idea here at the end of Isaiah chapter 55. The whole earth praises him for his wisdom, for his power, for the accomplishment of his will, and again, ultimately through Christ. 
Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Instead of thorns, there shall come up the cypress. One of the interesting things that you see throughout Isaiah is in the thread of their Babylonian captivity for 70 years, one of the things that's, one of the things that's said several times is Jerusalem's no longer going to be inhabited, it's going to be destroyed, and it's going to be a place of briars and thorns. I think, if I, I think I remember this correctly, Isaiah chapter 32 is one of those chapters that does this. Yeah, right here, Isaiah 32, 13. On the land of my people, we know what that can refer to, can only refer to. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken, the, bur the bustling city will be deserted. So, that's coming in, because of captivity. But in the future, in the kingdom of God on earth, there aren't going to be thorns and briars. There's, there's not going to be a forsaken city because it's a spiritual kingdom, and it's going to prosper. It's going to succeed. So, anyway, I guess that's where we'll stop this morning. Well, the end of verse 13, it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Again, physical Israel is going to be cut off. And ultimately, of course, that happens in, in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. The church is never going to be cut off. The kingdom of God on earth is never going to come to an end. And I tell you what, there's a passage that tells us that very directly in Daniel chapter 2 and verse, verses 44 and 45, the days of the fourth king, the fourth kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people and it will stand forever. God's church is not going to be defeated. Now, here's an interesting thought and we'll, I guess we'll kind of end here. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter, there's something told us that is going to happen when Christ comes back. All right, Christ is risen from the dead. He's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let's see here. Okay, then comes the end. All right, so when Christ returns, the time of the resurrection, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father. There are so many people in, in the religious world who believe that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back to get a kingdom. And the Bible never says that. The Bible, in fact, says the exact opposite. When the end comes, and again, this is within the context of the, the bodily resurrection, he's going to deliver the kingdom to God the Father. That's the only way the church on earth is going to come to an end, is when the world itself comes to an end and the kingdom is given back to God. Something to think about. All right, guys, let's stop there. That's Isaiah chapters 54 and 55. And I know I did a lot of back and forth, Old Testament to New Testament, but I think it's extremely important to connect the prophecies of Isaiah to their fulfillment, whether it's Romans or Acts chapter 13 or this passage right here. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that 1 Corinthians 15, 24 is a direct cross-reference to Isaiah 55, but the, the implication is there that this kingdom is not going to come to an end. So that's why I went to Daniel chapter 2 as well to show you that. But anyway, it shall be for uh, be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. That's the spiritual kingdom. Guys, appreciate you being here today. Plan on coming back tomorrow at 11. We'll pick up in Isaiah chapter 56. I don't know how far we'll get. Maybe we'll do 56 and 57. And maybe 58. But anyway, appreciate you being here today. Hope you have a good rest of your day. And hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.